The following interview was, con was conducted with Sony B. Ramasamy, Director of the Agriculture Research Programs and Associate Dean of, of Research for the College of Agriculture, Purdue University. The inter it took place on um, Tuesday, July the 14th, 2009, at his office in West Lafayette. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Kathy. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in yep. early years. Yeah, I was uh, uh, born, you can tell from my last name, Ramaswamy. I was born in India and uh, raised in India. I was born in a city called Hyderabad and then moved to Bangalore, the outsourcing capital of the world today. But back when I was a little kid, of course, it was uh, not the outsourcing capital. And in fact, you know, used to be, uh, India used to be uh, sort of a basket case back in the 1960s, had to rely on uh, the largest of the American people, for example, the food aid, et cetera, that were given as well. So I grew up under those conditions. And uh, grew up in a, you know, uh, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old. And uh, so it was my mother that raised us. I'm the youngest of four boys. And my mother, with uh, less than a high school education, worked very hard to make sure that we went to the best schools. So we, all four of us brothers, went to Jesuit schools. And we studied in Jesuit schools. And, uh, in the great, at grade school? Uh, all the way through high school. I went to Jesuit schools. So uh, finished my high school. And I wanted to, I, I started out in English literature because I wanted to be a writer. And I was, a, I was very young when I got into college. And my mom and my brothers uh, thought I was gonna make a big mistake. They thought I could only be a teacher, a school teacher, and that was not good enough. They wanted me to be a professional, like a doctor or something like that. Well, I didn't want to be a medical doctor because my brother was already in medical school, my eldest brother. So I ended up, my, my second brother applied for me to get into the vet school and the ag school at, at a university in India, in Bangalore. And I didn't want to go to the veterinary school because it's, you know, medical. And not that I'm afraid of uh, blood or anything like that, it's just that I didn't want to do it. Was so it of, in of interest? Yeah, I went to the agricultural college. And here I am many, many years later, well, literally 40 years later, 1969 is when I started uh, my undergraduate degree in Bangalore. And here I am as a person sitting here talking to you. Isn't Kathy. that great? Tell us a little bit about high school, how large was the school and any yeah. activities, and then a little bit about college. Yeah, I'll tell you, yeah. Well, so the high school that I went to, as I said, was a Jesuit school. Okay. It was St. All Joseph's All high boys? School. All boys, only boys. And it was a <laughs> bunch of uh, Jesuit uh, fathers that uh, taught us, not, including non-Christians and non-ordained uh, people taught us as well. And the school itself was... Uh, Probably about, uh, oh, I'd say in the neighborhood of around uh, uh, a thousand kids or so. So not very big, not very small. And it might even very well have been around 1,500 students or something like that. And uh, it was, uh, the, the fathers really spent a lot of time on the three R's, the reading, writing, and arithmetic. And along with the three R's, Communication was very important, both written and oral. And uh, so a lot of people ask me, you know, I grew up in India, how come I don't have an accent, you know? And, and I don't know, you know, I've, I've always talked like this. And uh, I think in part it's because uh, the, the fathers, you know, they dunned into us that it was very important to be able to articulate an idea and communicate very clearly, enunciate the words very clearly. And so there was that sense that's one part of it. And the other part is I have a, an ear for languages. I grew up uh, learning and speaking five languages from the time I was about uh, when I started talking. I've been speaking English probably since I've been about two or three years old. And, and because of that ability, I've got an ear for languages. And, you know, I can speak some Spanish and some Spanish, French as well. And uh, so that, that was high school. And in terms of activities... You know, I was not athletically oriented, and in fact, I was a skinny little kid and uh, not very intellectually, I mean, I was, not, I was not like the brilliant kind of person. I was not athletically oriented. I was your average kid. Enjoying right, school. Absolutely. Right smack dab in the middle of right. all the, the, the wonderful athletes and the wonderfully gifted children. I was average, and, but I loved school. I had a great time. 
And I, you know, I participated in everything. I have a big heart. I have a tremendous amount of willpower. And I would participate in everything. But I was not great at all of those things. I was average. And that's what I did in, in high school. College itself, I was went... Was college in the same town that you yes, were? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes. The so you, lived on, you didn't live on campus? No, no. I lived in my mother's house. Okay. And uh, college, I went to the uh, University of Agricultural Sciences in Bangalore. And i got to tell you a little bit about how agricultural colleges were established in India. Researchers will benefit yeah. from this. And, and so basically, as probably you know, as I said, India became independent from 1947. Britain, 1947. And India was very poor, and the infrastructure was not there, particularly agriculturally. And... The food minister in the 1950s from India came to America and talked to uh, the folks at the State Department like John Foster Dulles and other individuals saying that it would be great if America could come and replicate the land grant concept in India because he had read about the land grant concept the land grant colleges, the tripartite mission we have like here at Purdue, the research, extension, and teaching. And he asked for that. It sort of reminds me, and probably you as well, of the, the old biblical story of, you know, you give a man uh, food and he feeds himself for a day or you teach him how to, you know, or fish and he'll feed for himself for the rest of his life. And it was very, very, I mean, a lot of sort of parallels there. That happened. And... American agricultural colleges and the land-grant universities, such as Ohio State University, such as Michigan State University, such as University of Tennessee, adopted Indian agricultural colleges. The college that I went to was adopted in the very early 1960s by the University of Tennessee. And what they did was to bring people from India to the United States, to be trained, to be educated in modern agriculture, agricultural sciences. And then American instructors went to India and spent long periods of time at these institutions teaching, showing them how to do research and showing them how to grow crops using modern agricultural methods and things like that. That happened from about the very late 50s on through the 60s. Okay. Purdue at that time, you might want to know, was also involved in it, except Purdue did not go to India. Didn't they go Purdue to South America? Went to Brazil. Brazil. Okay. So Purdue was not involved in India. Uh, Michigan State was. Um, Ohio State was, our you know, neighboring institution, sister institutions right. in the Big Ten. The Big Ten really yeah. were involved. Yeah, they were very, very much involved. So that happened. These colleges were built in the image of the U.S. land grants with the tripartite mission of research, extension, and teaching. I mean, literally from the grassroots up. And people were being trained, et cetera, was happening. Well, right about that time, there was a second uh, thing that happened. Well, a gentleman named Norman Borlaug uh, came on the scene, had been on the scene, actually. He is a, an Iowan, a native Iowan, went to school at the University of Minnesota. He was a, a tremendous plant breeder geneticist. And he used to work uh, on wheat. And he figured out how to make dwarf wheat. And as you know, wheat and other crop plants, they grow very tall. And when they've become top heavy with the grain, when the wind blows, they just drop down and you lose the crop. And that was a big problem farmers faced. Even in America, farmers faced this problem. Well, Norm Borlaug, in the 1950s, 60s particularly, figured out the genetic basis of it and figured out how to make dwarf wheat and other dwarf species. He introduced those varieties of wheat into India. So there was a convergence here of the creation of these land-grant colleges in India and the introduction of these new varieties and modern methods of agricultural production. Okay. And that set into motion the Green Revolution. So India stands out as the epitome 
of the Green Revolution. And I was one of the beneficiaries of it because I went to that agricultural college in 1969, as I said to you, and graduated in 1973. I had the honor of meeting Norm Borlaug in 1971 as a young student. I remember this very distinctly. He came to Bangalore uh, to the campus. But, you know, he didn't know me from the average kid on the street. I did get to shake his hand. And then it was very sweet for me to, in 2005, I believe, yeah, 2000, no, it would have been, yes, it was in 2005. I had the privilege uh, of being in Mexico City at the International Rice, uh, International Wheat and Maize Research Institute. And Norm Borlaug is a 92 year old, was there still doing his research on plant breeding for wheat. And I got to sit and eat breakfast with him and I reminisced with him about this story about my growing up. Of course, he didn't know me from the street on the kid. Uh, but kid you on the street. remembered it made an impact. And of course, oh, it did. It was incredible. It's like seeing God, you know. And this guy single-handedly uh, contributed to the Green Revolution of the world. And if you remember, he got the Nobel Prize, the Nobel P, uh, Prize for Peace in 1973 because he brought about the Green Revolution. So I went to that agricultural college. And the education that I had was kind of education we had in America in the agricultural colleges, particularly in the 1950s and 1960s, which was very traditional. I learned crop production. I learned livestock production. I learned you know, rural sociology. I learned extension and entomology and plant pathology and things like that. Very All traditional. those key things, the good basic Absolutely. Foundation. And that's the college that I went to. And that's where I grew up in. And then I finished up and uh, I had the opportunity to, to go on for additional studies. And I ended up uh, studying uh, for my master's degree in entomology. I really loved entomology. And I would switched from English literature into agriculture. And then from agriculture, I had my first uh, entomology class as a sophomore. And I loved it. I fell in love with it. And here I am, you know, many years later, almost uh, 40 years later, as an entomologist, as an administrator here in America. And I got my master's degree in entomology. And uh, Were you married at that time? No, ma'am. Okay. I wasn't married. However, interesting you bring this up, my now wife, who grew up in North India, in New Delhi. And North India is about 15, uh, New Delhi is about 1,500 miles from Bangalore. And uh, she came to Bangalore to study, to go to college. And you know, we would have never met because you're in North India, oh, I'm wow. in South India, there's no way we would be, have met, except for the fact that she came to Bangalore to go to college because her aunt lived in Bangalore. And she finished her undergraduate degree in zoology at a different college, not in the agricultural college. And then she wanted to study entomology. And the only place you could study entomology in India was in the agricultural colleges. So she came to uh, the agricultural college. And it's a very competitive process to get into college in India and to go on to graduate school and things like that. You have to take a competitive exam. You get, because of the sheer population that we have in India, it's incredibly competitive. Hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people apply for these few slots that are available and my wife got selected and I got selected and I met her at that time. It was uh, about the same time you were... Oh wow, we were, took the exam at the same time, the, the entrance exam at the same time. We both passed, we both were admitted into the master's degree program and we both worked, uh, our mentor, our master's degree advisor, research advisor was the same person, uh, Dr. Erz, and Dr. Erz had received his PhD degree at Kansas State University. And I'll tell you that story in just a second, how it comes around full circle. You got a lot of connections. Here. A lot of connections. <laughs> and so my wife and I, at that time, we were not spouses. We, you know, worked together. And then only a year after that, we're great friends. We're very close friends. And only a year after that, as they say, we became an item. <laughs> and uh, we dated. And uh, so then I uh, uh, talked to her dad. I met her parents as well. They loved me right from the word get-go. And uh, as did my mother, loved my, uh, my wife now. 
And her name is Gita, by the way, and she is an associate dean of the graduate school at Purdue. Uh, and uh, so as it turned out, we weren't married at that time. We dated, and then I left to come to America in January of 1976. And my wife uh, took a little bit of a detour, as it were. She wanted to work for a couple of years, and she wasn't certain about coming to America. But I had come to America already. And so two years later, she followed, and she went to Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas, to get her PhD. I was in New Jersey at Rutgers University to get my PhD. How did you happen to select Rutgers? Ah, great question. Uh, we were doing our master's degree, and in 1973, there were still a lot of Americans going to India in those days. And As part of this program? Of these programs, places, yeah. Sure. The, the United Nations and the U.S. Agency for International Development invested a lot of money in countries like India, which we still do now, as you know. Sure. And a professor, Ayo Gupta, from uh, Rutgers University, was on a sabbatical at the University of Agricultural Sciences in Bangalore. He met me and my wife, and again, remember, we're not married, and uh, he you know, really liked, and he taught the class that we took, a, a graduate mm -hmm. class in insect physiology. And he really liked the way we you know, worked with him. He offered us the opportunity to work with him uh, to help in his research lab, etc. And he also offered some training sessions, and we ended up uh, helping him in offering the training sessions. I guess for both of us must have been quick studies because he really liked us, and we ended up working with him. <laughs> he offered me a chance to come to America. He said, hey, when you finish your master's degree, apply to come to America, and you can study with me. And at the same time, there was another gentleman named Bruce Johnson who came from the University of Tasmania in Australia. And he was there as well. And he also liked my wife and I, and we worked with him and we helped him with his training sessions. He also offered uh, me an opportunity to go study with him for my PhD. Well, literally it was a flip of the coin almost. Yeah. And I ended up coming to America. And you know, Pro if I had ended up going to Australia, I probably would have had an Australian accent or something like that rather than an American accent. And so I'm glad I came to America. I went to Rutgers and I lived in New Brunswick, New Jersey uh, and uh, got my PhD there at that time in 1979. I finished up. Well, in the, in the, during that same time, two years later, my wife went to Texas Women's University. And she, unfortunately, uh, she was doing her PhD in, in the area of molecular biology. She didn't want to go into entomology anymore, although she had a master's degree in entomology, but still staying within biology. Sure. And unfortunately, she had a falling out with her major professor. She left Denton, Texas. Came up to New Jersey. Uh, she applied to go to school at Michigan State University, where I had been offered a postdoctoral position. And even that came about sort of a, a serendipitous occurrence, as it were. I had uh, gone to a meeting in Connecticut, in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where Yale University is. And at this meeting, I, would, I gave a talk on gypsy moths. I used to work on gypsy moths in those days. And my PhD dissertation research was on cockroaches, on the sexual behavior of cockroaches. And, but from a graduate assistantship, I worked on gypsy moths. And I'd been invited by, by the professor who had hired me as the, for the graduate assistantship to go to Connecticut to give this talk. And uh, I was giving this talk in the audience of like maybe 150 people. There was a gentleman that was paying intent attention to what I was saying. And then he was, later on, I noticed him pointing at me and asking some questions as though he was asking questions. And just before we left Connecticut, for me to go back to New Jersey, and I knew who that individual was, he came up to me, his name was Ring Carday. He came up to me and said, hey, Sonny, remember me when, when you finish your PhD and you might want to come and work with me. And this guy in the entomological field is a very big name. You would have given your right arm to work with this individual. Oh, man, I was excited. I said, oh, my gosh, this is great. And uh, long story short, I ended up, you know, ultimately in 1979, December, moving to Michigan State University. So that had transpired.
And I said to my wife, and she was having a fallout, I'm going to move to Michigan. Why don't you apply to get into a PhD program at Michigan State? Well, in the meantime, my mom and her dad said, hey, you guys ought to get married. We've been dating now for, uh, well, almost uh, uh, five years. And they said, you might want to get married. And oh, by the way, in absentia, my, <laughs> during the two years I had already left, my mother, you know, she's, my wife Gita used to go and stay in my mother's home. Sure. And people were wondering who this young woman is. You got four boys and suddenly this woman shows up, right? And to avoid any sort of an embarrassment, you know, my mom announced that, oh, this is my youngest son, Sonny's uh, betrothed. And she had a party and she announced an engagement in my absence, you know. And, uh, Great story. Yeah, so, well, they decided that we needed to get married. And they came, my mother came and my father-in-law came from India. And we were living in New Jersey at that time. And we had the ceremony, and they wanted us to have a, a, a Hindu ceremony. Incidentally, I was born in a Muslim state, in a Hindu family, and I went to Jesuit schools. So I got exposed to multiple uh, religions, as it were. And, and so I sort of epitomized the multi-ethnic uh, values, I guess. And so she, my mother and father-in-law wanted us to have some sort of a Hindu ceremony because that's what they were used to. Sure. Well, the only temple in the tri-state area, that is New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, was being built in Queens, New York. It was a Ganesh temple, the elephant god temple. If you know Hinduism, the elephant god. So we went to that temple. They were still under construction. They had created the, the in quotes, the sanctum sanctorum. And they had established uh, a, an idol of uh, the deity of, of Ganesh. And there was no priest at that time, a Hindu priest. Well, one of my friends who knew somebody, who knew somebody, knew a person who was a scholar of Vedic literature. This is the Hindu scriptures. And that gentleman was my profession an engineer, but he was also a scholar of the Vedic literature, the Sanskritic literature. And he agreed to officiate at the ceremony. So he came on December the 10th of 1979. We had an abbreviated Hindu ceremony at this temple under construction. And Hindu ceremonies, there are three aspects to it that are very unique, but in some ways very similar. One is that it is a, uh, the vows are taken in front of the fire god. The fire god in Sanskrit, in the Aryan concept, is Agni, which is the same uh, root word as Ignis, Ignition. And the Greek fire god is Ignis, okay? Agni is Ignis. And you take your vows in front of the fire god. That's one thing. The second thing is you literally tie the knot, literally tie the knot. By that I mean, the groom is supposed to take, in the old days it used to be a string, now of course it's like a gold necklace, and at the appointed hour when this, the ceremony is taking place, the groom ties the, literally ties the necklace, now you have a clasp of course, and you put the clasp on. In the old days they used to literally tie a string, okay? So you tie the knot, that's the second thing. And the third thing is that after that's done, you take seven steps, and these are the seven steps of life that you go through, that you're promising you, the bride and the groom are holding hands. They're, they're also tied up by their clothing. There's a tying of that knot as well. And they hold hands, and they take, for each step, they talk about how you know, each one is gonna protect the other, or each one's gonna obey the other, and things like that. It's part of the vows that one takes. So we had a very abbreviated version that was done in a short period of time. Well, one more thing that is very unique is uh, in old Hindu uh, uh, culture, rituals, uh, the groom is supposed to give up, renounce his material living and go away to play a place called Banaras, Kashi, 
in northern India, northeastern India, where he would lead uh, a life, the life of an ascetic, okay, having renounced his worldly uh, wants and needs and material things, etc. And in Hinduism, you're supposed to go through that as part of your life, okay, to achieve salvation. And so in the Hindu ritual, the groom is supposed to say, okay, I don't want this. I'm going to go away. And you walk out from the place where the wedding supposed to, the ceremony is supposed to take place. You start walking away. And then the bride's father is supposed to come. It's called Kashi Yatra, which means the pilgrimage to Kashi, this Benares. And so the bride's dad is supposed to come and plead with you saying son come and marry my beautiful daughter why are you wanting to give this away you can go and renounce all this after you've married you've had children you go through these different stages in life as a youth you go through certain stages and then it's married life and then there's the post married life and at that, during that post married life you can do all this and she's a beautiful girl and blah 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 they do all these things that's when they give the dowry as well of course I didn't get a dowry we didn't believe in dowries Okay, so the father was supposed to say this, and then you say you, you acquiesce and you come together, and then you go through the ceremony. Well, guess what? December the 10th in America is winter. December the 10th, 1979, had snowed that previous night. And the clothes that you wear is traditional Indian clothes, which is what's called as a dhoti, which is basically a six yards that you wrap around yourself, it's made of silk for the bottom. And with the top, you're bare chested, except you have like a very thin silk uh, uh, stole like thing, like a scarf that you wrap around yourself. So you're, and you're barefooted. Okay, that's cold. And my father in law comes to me, he says, My father in law, after I got married, he comes to me and says, All right, it's cold, I'm freezing. You're freezing. You better get married. Go inside and get married to my daughter. You know. So we didn't do the real ritual like they do. So we ended up going back inside. We got married in New York City on December the 10th, 1979. And then, of course, that gentleman that performed the ceremony is not recognized, not by the state of New York, not by the state of New Jersey, not by anybody. Okay, But he performed the Hindu ritual. So then my wife and I went to the Middlesex County Courthouse in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, then we went and uh, uh, got, had a ceremony, with a civil ceremony with a judge over there. And we got married officially as well. Nowadays, you know, you fast forward 30 years later, the Hindu priests are also, you know, certified like, you know, other Christian priests, etc. To to do marry, that. yeah, to do the do the ceremonies and things like that. So we got married, moved to Michigan, and uh, finished up our uh, you know my PhD. And, and Gita, my wife, started uh, working. Uh, and oh gosh, I got married on the on the thirteenth, and on the seventeenth of December, I defended my PhD dissertation. And my PhD dissertation was on, as I said to you, on the sexual behavior of cockroaches, of German cockroaches. Uh, we're basically, we're trying to figure out how they uh, reproduce so that we could mitigate the reproduction. That was the intent. And so you have to study the, their behavior and things like that. And they utilize uh, these chemicals to attract the opposite sex. The female emits a chemical scent called the uh, sex pheromone that attracts the opposite sex, the male, and then they go through this courtship behavior and then uh, they'll reproduce, you know. So that was my research, and I defended it on the 17th of December. And then I moved on to Michigan. Oh, what a month, right? Before oh, gosh, it was incredible. Incredible month, yeah. Yeah, yeah I had a wonderful time, yeah. so we then, moved to Michigan. Then what came next after that? Well, in, in Michigan, I went to Michigan State University, another uh, great land rent institution. And your wife enrolled there, too? My wife enrolled in her Ph.D., and I went there, and, and I was a postdoctoral research associate. And I worked on spruce budworms, one of the most devastating pests of northern forests in America and in Canada as well. 
And again, I worked on the sexual behavior, identified the sexual signals, the, the scent, the chemical scent, and developed these traps and things like that. We identified the chemistry, we understood the behavior. I used to work in the middle of the night. These insects only fly at night. So I used to spend my time up in upper Michigan. So I'm showing you my palm of my right hand and my left palm is above it showing lower Michigan and upper Michigan. I used to do my research up there up in Houghton, Michigan. Way up on top in uh, Lake Superior, near Lake Superior, right. or shores of Lake Superior. And we identified the chemistry, we identified the behaviors, we figured out how they behave at night. All this done with night vision goggles. The technology, thanks to the Vietnam War, you can wear these goggles and look at these moths doing their thing. And we developed a trap that even today is utilized around the world, uh, a pheromone trap. It's baited with the sex pheromone. So the males will come to that trap and they get killed and you reduce the male population so you don't have reproduction taking place in the females. Mm -hmm. And I worked on that and my wife was doing her PhD at that time and ah, she, interesting twist again for her, she has a degree in entomology, remember first degree is in zoology, second degree is in entomology. She went to Texas to get a degree in molecular biology, but she had such a terrible uh, uh, experience with her major professor, she gave up that area. And in Michigan, she discovered there was a woman named Suzanne uh, Sontag, not the famous feminist, but a professor at Michigan State University. And uh, she ended up working with this woman who was in the textiles department and was developing clothing for protection of pesticide applica applicators. So my wife, she took her entomological in, uh, background and she's always been very artistic and she does beautiful sculptures and quilting and designs clothes, etc. So she took her clothing design interest and her entomological interest, combined the two to work with uh, Dr. Sontag at Michigan State University on her PhD of developing protective clothing for pesticide to prevent pesticide exposure in the workers in the agricultural field and in companies like DuPont and all that. Sure. So she was doing that, I was doing my postdoctoral work, and well, lo and behold, Rincar Day, the gentleman that saw me in, at the meeting, on, it was again a snowy day in New Haven, Connecticut. Oh man, it was so bad. It was like two feet of snow, we got stuck there. And I was working with him, and well, he got an offer that he couldn't refuse to move to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts. So he asked me if I wanted to move with him. He really wanted me to. And I said, no, my wife is, you know, doing a PhD. She's already got two years in and, you know, she's only got a couple more years to go. He said he understood. And he said, how about, he and I had written a grant proposal to do this research on the spruce budworms. And he said, why don't you keep the grant and that'll pay for your salary and you can renew it and pay for yourself. And I'll be the supervisor in quotes, remote supervisor as it were. So we agreed and I stayed put and I was doing this and, the, and then finally the money ran out and I worked with another gentleman, his name is Fumio Matsumura, very famous toxicologist, insecticide toxicologist. He had written the book on insecticide toxicology. I had the privilege of working with him on rat brains and looking at the rat responses to pesticides, basically. Well, I did that. And, interesting twist, a friend of mine, a guy named Jim Lasham, used to be at Mississippi State University as a, as a postdoctoral research associate. He had been newly hired as a young assistant professor at Rutgers when I was doing my PhD. And I've always been pretty good with uh, plumbing and electrical stuff. I'm good with my hands. And in part because I'm unafraid, I can take risks. And I can open up an engine and repair it, you know, an automobile engine or uh, whatever. I don't worry. I can open up VCRs and DVD players and televisions and not know a thing about it and I'll fix it. I just kind of muddle my way through it and fix it because I'm unafraid to open these things. So he came and he knew nothing about any of these things. And I helped him rig up all these measuring instruments 
to measure temperatures six feet below ground and because he was working on Colorado potato beetles and he was interested in their responses to cold temperatures and things like that and I'd help them get set up I'd you know uh, basically jury rigged all these lights and things like that for him in the greenhouses and uh, uh, done all sorts of things and he loved the way I'd done it so he calls me up one day on the telephone I'm in Michigan and he's in, at Rutgers he said hey you know what Sonny there's a a faculty position that uh, at Mississippi State University you ought to apply for. And my intentions in those days were I was wanting to go back to India or work in the international arena, maybe in Africa or South America or Asia. And that was my intent. That's what it, I was waiting for my wife to finish up. We're going to do that. Uh, Jim calls me up and says, there's a position. I said, oh, man, I'm not interested. No, where in the heck is Mississippi State University? I don't even know where it is. Let alone where's the state located, right? Yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, well, he talks, you know, my wife, and uh, she says, you know, there's no harm. You should apply just for the heck of it. At least you get some experience. If they call you for an interview, right. you can say, I've experienced an interview for a position in, in America. And I said, oh, man, I'm not really interested in this. I want to go back, you know. And she and Jim, they said, no, you must apply well, long story short, I look up at the look up the de the the position the announcement. The deadline had passed already. <laughs> so I said, "Well, the deadline's passed already." And my wife says, "Oh, it's okay. You know, there's no harm in calling and talking to those people." So I called the gentleman at Mississippi State University, the head of the entomology department. His name is Tom Helms, and I introduced myself and I told him who I was and I, who I'd worked with. Immediately his ears perk up. I can see this happening. I mentioned the names of Rinkarde and Fumio Matsumura. These are the, like I said, top in the game. He said, oh my gosh, that is fantastic. He said, go ahead, send your application in. The deadline's passed, but we've not, we're only now collating the application. If you can get it to me, and this is before the days of, this is in 1982, before the days of uh, Federal Express and things like that. And I sent it by mail. He got it the following week. And uh, long story short, uh, I get called for an interview. And oh, it was incredible. I went all the way from Houghton, Michigan, on one of the, it started at four in the morning on one of those milk run airplanes. And got to, four in the morning, got to Columbus, Mississippi through Memphis, Tennessee, at four o'clock in the afternoon, 12 hours later. And Tom Helms came, picked me up, and took me, I interviewed, and later on my colleagues there told me that I wowed him, wowed him. And uh, so, long story short, I get offered the job. And uh, now I'm saying, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do, you know? And my wife says, oh, you got to take it. I said, but how about you? Oh, we had our daughter in the, at that time. Our only child, our daughter, is, her name is Mega. And we had her. She was born at Lansing General Hospital. And uh, this is, you know, it was kind of interesting. We weren't going to have any children at all. And then we ended up, it was going to, it was a, we thought my wife was pregnant. And we had this big celebration, champagne and things like that. The next morning she had a period and so we said, oh my gosh, we've told the world that you're pregnant. Why don't we go ahead and get pregnant? And, you know, she got pregnant the next month, I guess. And we had Meg, our daughter, and our only child. We decided we only have one child. Give her the best in, the, in life. Well, so the decision was, I was going to go to Mississippi, and my wife was going to stay put in uh, Michigan, finish her PhD. So, okay, and she's going to keep our daughter. And I went to Mississippi, and a semester later, she said she couldn't handle it. There's no way she's going to do it. So she talked to Dr. Sontag, and Dr. Sontag said, you've done enough work to get a master's degree. Why don't you go ahead and get, take a master's in textiles and not just quit? Okay, she un I understand. Go ahead and do this. So she did, and I went up to uh, Lan uh, Lansing, Michigan, and then we drove down to, to Starkville 
and in my pickup truck, I, and I love pickup trucks as well, so we drove down to Mississippi and got into Starkville, Mississippi, and uh, we lived there for 15 years, the longest we've lived in any one place in America. And uh, if you can imagine our daughter, an Indian kid with a southern accent, beautiful young lady. Uh, unfortunately, my pictures are all packed and gone. I just showed a picture uh, to you. And she grew up there in Starkville, Mississippi. Yeah, because she was very, she wasn't even a year old when she went She was 18 months old oh, okay. when we moved. And a lot of my friends in the North asked me if I'd had issues. You know, being of the brown skin persuasion, they thought that I might have problems down in Mississippi, you know? And I, in the early 80s, and I, you know, I'll tell you this, I never had a problem. We found the Mississippians that we worked with to be the most gracious people. And I even worked with the redneck farmers in, in the Mississippi Delta. And maybe it were not for the fact that I was a professor at Mississippi State, that I was there uh, doing research on pests of cotton, King Cotton, the most important crop in Mississippi. In the South. In the South, in Mississippi. They probably wouldn't have given me the time of day and they might have treated me differently. But because my, one of my friends, an Indian person that lived there in the 60s, used to go to do his field research with his major professor, a white guy. This is in uh, 71, 72. And he tells me he was, they were, used to go into the Delta. Starkville, Mississippi is on the eastern side of the state. The Delta is on the western part of the state. They'd stop at a restaurant, for example, after they finished their work to get something to eat. And a couple of times, they wouldn't allow the Indian person to go into the restaurant because he was of a different skin color. And Henry Petrie, this professor that was later on my colleague, he told me that they walked out. And, and Henry Petrie himself is a, is a Cajun. And, uh, and he hated it that, that his student was being treated like that. But by the time we came, it was very different. And I'm, I'm, I've always been very outspoken. In Starkville, I got involved with the school board. Uh, I was very active in the community theater. I loved to, you know, I was on stage. I was behind the scenes. I became very good at building sets and things like that. And we even bought the community theater group, even bought Starkville Community Theater. We bought an old building that housed J.C. Penney's on Main Street, Starkville, Mississippi. We ripped the inside of it and built this beautiful theater. I was involved in it. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. That I've invested time in. And we gave as well. So if you ever go to Starkville, Mississippi, go to the community theater out on Main Street and you'll see pictures of me and my name in there. My handprint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then I also got involved in Habitat for Humanity, by the way, and helped build several homes. On Saturdays, that was my favorite thing to do. I did. I love to do my research. I'll tell you my, my research in just a second. On Saturdays, I love to go to Habitat for Humanity. I learned plumbing, electrical, electrical work, roofing, putting down decks, drywall, carpeting, carpentry, the whole nine yards. It was on-the-job training. I loved it. I learned a lot from doing those kinds of things. And then the blood, sweat, and tears to see these people actually get these homes. And it's oh, it the most gratifying thing that I've done in my life was working on Habitat homes. I worked on multiple homes. My research, again, was on pests of cotton. These two species are the most devastating pests that you can have in cotton. They together used to cause one billion dollars worth of damage in cotton. And we identified the sex pheromone again to try to monitor for the pest. We can, by looking at the number of males caught, you can predict how many caterpillars you're gonna have, the damaging stage that would destroy the cotton crop. We did that. We also came up with a, a nifty device like a pregnancy test kit. The big problem that farmers have is to tell these two species apart in the egg stage. And the window of opportunity to control these insects is only three days. 
And you've got to do it when either they're eggs or when the caterpillars are very young larvae. And we uh, went ahead and developed this kit that is just like a pregnancy test kit. You take an egg in the field and you crush it and the color changes. If it turns yellow, it's species A. If it turns blue, it's species B. And we got a patent on it. It sold like hotcakes throughout the cotton world. So growing. needed. Yep. Oh, what a and what's, yeah. And what it's done is saved farmers millions of dollars. Not only in less pesticides used, but untold millions in saving the environment for, from environmental contamination. So that's my story. And I've got lots of stories about, uh, you know, towards the end when I was getting ready to leave Starkville, the townspeople had convinced me I ought to run for mayor in town. And their comment was that, you know what, white people will vote for you and black people will vote for you because you're kind of in between, you know, brown skinned and, and you get both votes, you get elected. And if I had to have lived in, and continued to live in Starkville, Mississippi, I probably would have run for uh, the mayor's won, office. Sure. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Who knows? But I was at a, I was at a meeting in Florence, Italy, and uh, we're, we just finished Inter International Congress of Entomology in 1996. And uh, we just finished uh, playing tag football. We're sitting at a piazza drinking wine. And we you know, got into this discussion about what makes a good administrator, you know. And I, oh, at Mississippi State, I had the reputation of being a rabble rouser. And because uh, I was totally unafraid to ask questions of authority, including calling the president, Donald Zacharias, one time in a, an article that I wrote in the newspaper, I called him and uh, said, who is this idiot that did this, you know, and later on discovered it was Donald Zacharias, the president. And I was very, very active in, in asking questions of the vice president for research, the provost, the dean, the department head. And uh, to the extent, some of them wanted to get rid of me, fire me. And they couldn't because I did outstanding research and outstanding teaching. And I worked in the community as well. A lot. I really helped a lot of people. And, uh, oh, there are some threats made against me. And one time, the one individual, a vice president, told my department head to tell me to watch out. And I told the department head to tell him to take a hike. Actually, I used a choice four-letter word is what I did, a different choice four-letter word than hike. I told him to take a hike. And I said, if he has the guts to, he should come and tell me about it directly first. And I wouldn't listen anyway because this is very important what we're doing to protect the interests of the university and the taxpayers. And we caught them involved in some shenanigans. And then I said, the second thing I said was, the only reason I'd quit doing this is if they came and burned a cross in front of my house or threatened my wife and my daughter. Otherwise, I'll continue to do this. To the extent that people would slip underneath my door and send anonymously photocopies of things happening on campus. Hmm. There's a real shenanigans going on. Sounds like it. With this particular vice president. Hmm. And uh, so that was my sort of a life. And I was, you know, and I hated administrators, people like me. And, but that was in Mississippi, though, where it was all top now. Either you, when they called you and said jump, you said how high? You didn't ask any questions. And so I was at this piazza, we we're talking about, you know, what makes a good administrator? I said, I don't know any good administrator. They're all terrible. And one of my friends, his name is Kobe Shaw. He is a professor at North Carolina State. He said, well, you know what? They got a department headship at Kansas State University. You have to throw your money where your mouth is, throw your hat in the ring, become a department head, and make the changes. I said, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I don't want to become one of them. And we laughed and we drank some more. I went home. I remember this distinctly. On a Saturday, I went back home from Florence, Italy, down to, back to Starkville, Mississippi. And on the Tuesday following, my wife comes home with a letter from Kansas State University asking her to apply for a faculty position there. Your wife? Yeah. Interesting. And my wife went, oh, well, my wife's story is a separate story. It's a long story about it. In the meantime, she went on to get her PhD, and they were like, you know, and, and she became a hot commodity. At Mississippi. At Mississippi State. She was a professor there. 
I mean, she has a beautiful, great story as well. And it was all sort of serendipitous, her stepping into these different positions, you know. It's because of my reading the newspaper and, and reading from the very first word to the last word, I'd catch these little snippets. And she applied for these positions and she got her PhD. And uh, she had a very, very successful career as a faculty member at Mississippi State. She continued her research on textiles and protective She was in the textile? Is that what, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, well, so she gets a letter from K-State saying they would like her to apply there. I said, oh my gosh, you know, um, I'm an atheist. And I said, you know, somebody is, there's like conversions here, twilight zone. <laughs> You got this letter, and I tell you, my friend Cody was telling me about, about the position at K-State. So I told her, why don't you go ahead and apply and see what happens? And I emailed Kobe, and I said, Kobe, nominate me now. You know? And, well, again, a long story short, my wife goes through the, she comes up flying colors. Her competition with a guy from Cornell. She is tremendous. She's an award-winning researcher, award-winning teacher. And she gets offered the job. And she pushed me again. Like she did pushing me to apply to Mississippi State. She pushed me to apply to K-State. And we talked to our daughter who was a sophomore in college at a high school at that time. Long time. It took us many months of talking whether she would be willing to move. And I remember she, her best, one of her best friends, Christy Arians, is the daughter of a football coach who had been fired every two years. And she said, look at me, I keep moving every two years, you know? And she said, move, pretend like you're going to college two years early. And Mega came and told us, okay, I'm ready to go. And so, well, as it turned out, I got selected as well for the department headship. I had zero administrative experience. In fact, Mark Johnson, the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, told me later on, he called that vice president who had threatened me to ask him about me, and the vice president had told him, don't touch him with a 10-foot pole. He is terrible. Well, Mark thought, okay, if you're saying that, then this guy must be very good, so I'm gonna go ahead and hire him, because you know, Mark knew him as well, as to what kind of a character he was. Mm -hmm. And we moved to K-State, and I was there uh, as the head of the entomology department. I kept my research, continued to do all these things on on the reproductive biology of insects. Uh, and there are a lot of outcomes of our research. So I worked in the fundamental realm, but you know, there's, there's a guy named Donald Stokes who's written this book called Pastoris Quadrant. And he talks about how there is no conflict between applied research and fundamental research because we try to put this artificial conflict. He says it's a continuum. Pastor, Louis Pastor was like that. He did fundamental research, and that thing got, you know, at different times he was in different parts of this continuum. And that's the way I've been. And the way I look at it, and the way I've communicated that here at Purdue as well as the director of ag research programs, is don't set up these false arguments, these false conflicts. You do undertake fundamental research, you adapt it, you integrate it, and you disseminate it. That is the continuum, okay? At different times, as a faculty member, you might be undertaking research in different realms. I can give you so many examples of faculty at Purdue in our college that do that. They epitomize this, this idea of this pastoralist quadrant that Donald Stokes has talked about, that this continuum that you've got. And that's the way my research has always been. Some of my research was uh, um, try to explain the fundamental basis of reproduction in insects. And some of my research how farmers saved millions of dollars. The same research was adapted and integrated and then disseminated. Okay. So as a department head, I facilitated this research and extension and teaching. And our, our department went from a, a department that was an also ran mediocre department of entomology to one of the top five departments in the nation. And I had a lot of fun doing it. I continued working in the Habitat thing at, in Manhattan, Kansas. I continued working with the theater there, except I didn't have time to learn the lines and go on stage. I worked back in, in the background, building sets and things like that. And uh, 
you know, I was made a, I was, uh, the president, John Weefald, uh, has this award for outstanding department head. I got that award uh, when I was at K-State. I became a university distinguished professor. It's like the highest level that you Sorry, can get. That's right. And uh, for my research. Oh, I had a wonderful time. It was so fantastic. It was so fantastic. Got our faculty that was highly factionalized working together again. And never it's with... It's nice to see accomplishments yeah. and pull things. Yeah. Never with threats. Just step back and... And help them, only help them. And, you know, I said I only use the carrot policy. There's never the stick policy. And it worked a lot better. Yeah. And I learned that, by the way. In my daughter's preschool in Starkville, Mississippi, Ms. Helen Davis had told us, when you work with children, you never say no to them. You only use positive reinforcements. And then Jim Kaufman, the provost that K-State sent me to the Harvard University to go to the Harvard uh, yeah, management program. Sure. And I went there, and you know, it's a week-long boot camp, right? Serious management things that you're learning. And I'd already been a department head for three years, and I'd become quite successful at it. I, I sort of had the knack for it, I guess. And I did everything opposite of the administrators I'd been exposed to previously. And so I was successful at it. And a provost from the University of Illinois was at the management program at Harvard, had come as a guest lecturer. And she said, the first thing you do as an administrator is buy a book on raising children. And that's the way to work with faculty and people is faculty tend to be like children. And, uh, and it's child psychology. That's what you want to be, uh, wanted to use. And it's absolutely correct. I would, I would say that it's absolutely true. That, that's true. And, and in, far, in part, I was very successful because I followed that sort of a, an approach, as it Follow were. It. Right. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of other things, you know, at, at Manhattan and at K-State that I did, I was very involved in the community again. Very involved on campus in the campus theater scene as well. Worked with a lot of students, and I built an insect zoo, one of a kind. There is nothing like it. You know, we talk about the cricket spinning contest here at, at Purdue. You got to go to the insect zoo at K State. It is absolutely fantastic. It's a gorgeous facility, all hands on. And it was by the time it got done, it was about four hundred thousand dollars worth of in-kind work, labor, money that was contributed by the campus community and some of the stores in town as well. We built it, and it's an award-winning facility that's still there, even now. You know, I've already been gone three and a half years. It's a very successful entity that still uh, brings a lot of kudos to the okay. entomology department at K-State. I built a butterfly conservatory there as well and uh, had a lot of fun. Our daughter got married in Manhattan, Kansas. That's another long story about the marriage of our daughter. It's a beautiful ceremony that she got married to a young man named Andrew Park from Western Kansas, Oakley, Kansas. And we had a, a combined Hindu slash Christian ceremony that they invented, literally. They took the best parts of the Hindu rituals and the best parts of the Christian rituals, put them together and they got married. And oh, we had a fantastic time. Fantastic time. My wife spent two months in India designing clothes and the jewelry that the bride wore, the groom wore, the bridesmaids wore, and the groomsmen wore. It was fantastic. It was, oh, even now they talk about our daughter's wedding in Manhattan. <laughs> so we came, I guess we're going to run out of time here. Um, I'm going to, I want, let me see. Wrap up Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, that? yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, K-State was a wonderful place. It's another... Uh, K-State was, by the way... And, of course, that's the land-grant. That's the land-grant university. Right. Okay. Was involved in helping India develop and become what India is today as well. I mean, India is what it is today. Because and I say this to everybody. Because America, of the Yeah. America is what it is today because of land-grant colleges in America. Abraham Lincoln was the president... It was a time of strife when this concept was invented. Right. Right. The Moral Act was passed. And oh, it, it gives me goosebumps when you read the history of this thing. It's incredible. 
I think that a lot of people should be more aware of what really the land grant. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the foundation for it. Absolutely. And I know what you're saying. Yeah, and in a time of strife, there were terrorists out and about. They were destroying the bridges and the economy and things like that. This thing was invented, and what it allowed us to do was in America, only two percent of the population is involved in the agricultural enterprise. Food is so cheap in this country. We can now spend our money and time, 98% of the population spends its time on inventing and innovating. And we have, we spend only 10 cents on the dollar on food in this country. We have 90 cents on the dollar that we can invest in building the roads and the hospitals and going to the moon and going to Mars and things like that. In India, when I was growing up, it used to cost about 80 cents of every dollar a person earned to eke out, get enough food. Today, in India, they only spend less than 30 cents. Okay? So, and it's a smaller percentage of people working. So, you know, you see India in the news all the time. It's like the fourth richest country in the world today. And probably in about uh, uh, 15 to 20 years or so, it'll surpass the United States in terms of the sheer wealth that it's going to generate, economic activity it's going to generate. In large measure, thanks to the United States of America, in large measure, thanks to the land-grant universities of America, like Purdue University, like Michigan State, like Ohio State. And really, India stands out as the sort of the, the, the epitome of that green revolution that has been taken hold. And today we talk about it being the outsourcing capital of the world. For, for America and the rest of the Western sure. world, right? So K-State was involved in also doing this in India in helping establish the Andhra Pradesh uh, Agricultural University. And uh, incidentally, I did a lot of international work as well along the way. I did a lot of work in Africa particularly. I got my research. I got funding from the U.S. Agency for International Development. While you were at Kansas State? Uh, while I was at Mississippi State and, Kansas State. and at Kansas State. I got to travel a lot. I, you know, I guess I'm very lucky. I've traveled on all the continents except Antarctica. And, oh, by the way, I'm a motorcyclist as well. Uh, I ride Harley Davidsons. And, uh, yeah. and I turned 50 a few years ago. My wife and daughter, for my midlife crisis, they decided they were going to give me a uh, Harley Davidson. And back in 2005, my son-in-law and I, we went motorcycling in the Himalayas. And Andrew calls it the trip of a lifetime. It was incredible. It was exhilarating in part, scary in part, awesome in part. I mean, it's just the most amazing, uh, amazing uh, ups and downs, literally and figuratively. It was fantastic. We had a great time, and we bonded a lot, too. And I was still at Kansas State University when I did that, too. So a lot of international work, and and worked with multiple different departments and colleges and doing things. And, and uh, part of my, my modus operandi is to have fun at everything that I do. And I want to enable people. That's my, uh, my other aspect. And the third thing is I want to make a difference. And it really, I think, in many ways comes from my mother. Being an only, uh, I mean, uh, being a single parent, I don't think if our dad was alive, it would have been like this. I think it was our mother that raised us, four boys. Abject poverty, you know, I mean, not abject poverty, but we're very, very uh, poor. I mean, we're at the lowest levels. And uh, she raised us that you need to be accountable, you need to be responsible, and you want to make a difference. And, and those are Good very principles. important. Yeah, very important principles that have guided me as well and my brothers. And uh, yeah, I mean, all four of us brothers have done very well. My eldest brother lives in India. He's a surgeon, chief of surgery. My second brother lives in San Diego. He's got a company. Uh, he's a PhD in, in genetics. And uh, my third brother is an industrialist in India, in Bangalore. And he works with the outsourcing groups, you know, like the General Electric and all that manufacture the CAT scan machines, the MRI machines in Bangalore. He helps them package them and sell them around the world. That's what my third brother does. So yeah, Manhattan, Kansas was fantastic. We lived there for about eight and a half years and I came here. Coming here again was uh, 
as, as we wrap up on this first yeah. session, uh, you know, I was doing great at K-State, and I could do that for another 20 years. And, you know, when you, when you get to a certain point, headhunters and various people start nominating you for positions. And I got all these invitations to apply for these various positions, and, and uh, had considered some of them seriously including the, the one at the, uh, at the University of Georgia, for example, and Dean's positions and the position that I'm here in now, currently at, uh, at Purdue. Well, Randy Whitson called me, the provost, current provost at, at Purdue. He used to be in my position as the director of equity research programs and associate dean for research. And I had met him at Dean's Obedience School, as we call, back in 97 in Lincoln, Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska. And I was nominated by some faculty here. Um, I collaborated with Dirk Meyer, who used to be a professor at Purdue, and he's now at K-State, as it turns out. Dirk was instrumental in my coming here. He nominated me for the position. And I blew him off. I said, oh, man, I don't know. I'm so happy at K-State, you know. And he persisted, because Dirk and I used to collaborate on research. And uh, he knew me very well. He said, no, no, you love Purdue, you know, this is the right place for a guy like you. You're excited about things, you want to make a difference in people's lives, this is a great place. Boil her up. Yeah, boil her up. And then I said, nah, and then Randy called me a couple of times, and Randy called me again the day of the deadline oh, for applications. He said, what do you lose, just send that application in by, you know, email. And I talked to my wife and said, okay, we'll do it. And I submitted it. And, you know, it's a national search, so there's no guarantees of anything. And I went through the process. They interviewed several of us. And lo and behold, Randy called me up and offered me the position. And, uh, and, and here I am. As, oh, in fact, when he called me up to say to come for the interview, I was getting ready to go to India for my motorcycling trip with uh, Andrew, my son-in-law in the Himalayas. And so I came back from India, came here to interview, and then he offered me the job in, in 2005, and I started on January 1, 2006. So, and my wife and I have been here since, and you know, we can talk about well, some specific questions the next we're, time. This will be end part one, okay. okay.